think it's uh, I think it's more Did you can see on on screen to see them or is this even on the web? Yeah, actually, here it is still there. They need to call in the office. I have uh, surgery in April, but they usually call me somewhere in July. So. Um, you, you can call. Okay. And then same for Calvin because he just hit his two year mark. I would call. Hmm? Well, clearly they've changed this again. Share slides. I don't want to share slides. How do I? Oh, no, I want to go to. No, they've changed it. They've got added, added a bunch of new buttons on it. You can barely see that. Is that better or no? Yeah. Can you see it? Because I can't see. And I can't see what you see. Yes, I am. All right. I think once you make it full screen, you have to make it. How do I make the full screen? Oh, there. Um, then now I don't see the uh, comments. All right. Um, Good afternoon. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to start our webinar. This is um, we're going to talk about iron deficiency anemia, and as usual, it's sort of a hot topic. And um, I've tried to uh, present this not only from a iron deficiency anemia in a general terms, but also um, uh, try to highlight the correlation that exists between iron deficiency, iron absorption, and weight loss surgical procedures in general. This is not supposed to substitute what I may or may not have individually shared with our own patients, and it's not supposed to replace what your doctor may be uh, recommending you to um, do to correct an iron deficiency that you may have. Um, I want to start by sort of pointing out a very uh, simple yet descriptive slide as to um, where uh, are different uh, electrolytes uh, absorbed in the GI tract. And we can look at the last column if hopefully it, it, it reflects well. And this is going to be recorded, and you're, you're going to have this uh, available on our uh, website. As you can see, iron, for the most part, is primarily absorbed at the first uh, part of the GI tract, namely the duodenum. Uh, as we'll see in the following slides, um, in order for the iron to be absorbed, there's a number of chemical reactions that also need to take place uh, in the stomach that has to do with the acidity, with the interaction with the intrinsic factor, B12, and so forth, for the iron to be uh, not only bioavailable and become functional for its purposes, which is not only red cells and uh, formation of uh, sort of oxygen carrying capacity, but also there's immune regulation and things like that and fighting infection. Um, and so 
iron, as this uh, drawing demonstrates, is primarily absorbed in the first part of the duodenum. When you take that into consideration, we can appreciate why patients with gastric bypass operation have such a high incidence of iron deficiency anemia because uh, by definition in a gastric bypass you excluded the entire almost all of the stomach so any chemical reaction that's supposed to take place in the stomach to prepare the iron that's ingested for absorption doesn't take place furthermore the part of the small bowel namely the duodenum where iron absorption is supposed to take place is excluded from the GI tract so th this explains anatomically where patients with gastric bypass have a very high incidence of iron deficiency anemia. Uh, when we talk about the duodenal switch, we will uh, divide maybe about a third to half, or maybe about half or a little less than the, that of the duodenum, duodenum to be included in the GI tract. So in the duodenal switch, we don't have the exclusionary effect of the stomach. So some, if not most of the chemical reactions that are supposed to take in the stomach to prepare the iron for absorption still take place, but because of the duodenal switch component of the procedure, which is exclusion of maybe, let's say, 60, 70, 80 percent of the duodenum, you have much reduced surface area for the iron to be absorbed. So with this context, now we're going to sort of, you know, uh, talk about uh, how these things present uh, and uh, what they look like. In general, uh, anemia for in the context of weight loss surgery, and what we're talking about is microcytic hypochromic red cells. That technically means it's a small red cell that also looks pale. The red color of it comes from the oxidative state of the iron. Um, the, the inadequacy of the structural matter, we always talk about the iron deficiency, but we also have to bear in mind that a red cell is made of the protein, some vitamins that put it all together, minerals, and iron. So a patient that is severely protein malnourished but has adequate amount of uh, iron may still be suffering from iron deficiency anemia. And that's something that we see patients that have been far and out uh, long gone and they sporadically follow up with us. They may be fighting anemia uh, even though they may have adequate or near normal iron with low protein level that needs to be corrected. Iron deficiency is the most common it's most commonly due to inadequate dietary sources of iron, and this is sort of iron deficiency. Um, it is also the most common of all uh, anemias in general. Uh, determining the cause of iron deficiency is critical uh, because, as we uh, alluded to on the very first slide, this may be driven by either stomach issues uh, where the chemical pre preparation needs to take place, the absorption um, issues, and that absorption issue may again have multiple uh, variables, the, uh, the iron, the location, or the cofactors that are needed to absorb to allow for iron absorption and uh, preparation of the red cell. Cause of iron deficiency anemia, uh, most commonly uh, in, in our patient population that we see is menstruation, and uh, it is important that any blood loss is corrected before uh, supplementation can correct the existing deficiency. So those uh, deficiencies can start from menstrual losses, GI tract losses, and uh, peptic ulcer disease, mucosal injuries in patients that have hiatal hernias, uh, drug ingestion, non-steroidal, um, anti-inflammatories such as Toradol, Motrin, Alivan, things like that, steroids uh, and potassium and parasitic infection, inflammatory bowel disease, and uh, cancers are all uh, causes of this, uh, causes that can lead to iron deficiency anemia. Now, I know that, uh, you know, when patients ask me, can, can we take uh, non-steroidals after duodenal switch? The answer is, again, yes. This slide only says that taking non-steroidal can increase the patient's cause for have gastrointestinal bleeding. It doesn't, doesn't mean that we should not take them. Uh, also, surgical uh, blood loss, and t uh, in a case of a tissue loss, it could be a cause of iron deficiency anemia. One of the most common causes that we see is when we do uh, uh, paniculectomies, abdominal plasty, when we remove a lot of abdominal wall tissue, we need to appreciate that the tissue that's removed inherently has blood vessels in them, and the blood vessels within them have red cells in them, and there's really no way to sort of milk this blood back into the system before you remove the tissue. So inherently by removing the tissues, you're also removing uh, some red cells with it that need, needs to be replenished. Um, as we continue iron deficiency anemia, 
lack of diet ARN, uh, infancy, uh, in, in infants, uh, not enough uh, in milk, so that's why kids, needs to have, kids, uh, kids need to have iron supplementation. Uh, pregnancy, and um, in the case of pregnancy, it's really not a true anemia. It's delusional as uh, pregnancy will cause for uh, a female's uh, water, uh, circulating water to go up that will cause dilution of the red cell. And you know, the analogy of that would be if you have a certain amount of dye and you, you, you uh, put that amount of dye in a bucket versus in a bathtub. So if it's in a bathtub, it's less dilute and that presents the dilutional uh, anemia that's present in pregnancy. Uh, last but not least, the cause that we probably have to deal with uh, all the time is malabsorption uh, in the case of iron deficiency anemia. And, um, I want to sort of elaborate that when we're talking about malabsorption, we're going to focus on malabsorption anemia, and that can be caused by iron deficiency and or protein deficiency. So uh, malabsorption in the scheme of the spectrum of all of the iron deficiency anemias is very rare. It only occurs in the subset of patients that have had either weight loss surgical procedures, have uh, some sort of a malignancy or cancer, or they have some sort of a GI malabsorptive disease conditions such as spruce, uh, you know, uh, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, or something like that. And when we talk about anemia, we're going to have to emphasize the importance of not only iron deficiency, but also vitamin and protein deficiency that can lead to uh, clinical end result of iron deficiency anemia. Um, iron metabolism, and we're going to after this couple of these boring uh, you know, text slides, we're going to look at some pictures that will make a little more sense. Iron absorption, the ferritin is essentially a buffer. It, they think of it as a sponge that needs to be saturated before it starts dripping the iron on the other end. So it's a, a storage shock absorber of some sort to smooth out the uh, daily fluctuations. It takes up the iron excess and releases the iron as needed. And because of that, as we'll see on one of the slides, uh, fer ferritin um, uh, levels will fluctuate um, sort of out of sync with the level of iron that's taken in and out of sync even further with the patient's hemoglobin and hematocrit. So we should not necessarily gauge a patient's anemia level but by just focusing on the hemoglobin and hematocrit because that probably will be one of the latter things that will start showing evidence of iron deficiency. The amount of serum ferritin closely reflects the iron stores, and it sort of is a, it's a relatively easy way to uh, keep an eye on a patient's iron stores long term. Uh, problems with um, iron metabolism is that uh, uh, ferritin increases in chronic inflammation, so pay, and, and uh, that, this is one of the immune regulatory mechanisms that uh, iron is involved with. Ferritin is also increasing hepatocellular, hepatocellular disease. Patients that have chronic hepatitis or uh, you know, liver injuries can have falsely elevated ferritin, and uh, ferritin can also be increasing malignancy. So in patients that we've been able to rule out those other causes of elevated ferritin, it's a um, relatively reliable uh, index to follow uh, as far as iron deficiency is concerned, iron stores are concerned. Iron component, looking at this, the, the ferritin again, uh, the, the transferrin. Transferrin is the molecule uh, that essentially is the transport truck uh, that um, uh, it's, a, it's a protein and it's uh, synthesized by the liver and macrophages. Each one of them is can uh, bind uh, and sort of carry to iron molecule. Usually about one third, uh, about 22, 45 percent of the total transferrin is bind to iron and that sort of presents itself as a, a percent saturation. So usually you can do the math backward and then come up with a guesstimation of what the total iron is because 30% of it is only bound to the uh, transferrin. Transferrin carries iron via the plasma uh, to the cells through the body and that sort of uh, is when, when it's absorbed on one side of the cell, carried over to the other side into the plasma, into the circulation, this ends up being able to take it to uh, from the absorptive side into the blood supply to the bone marrow, and then that's where the processing takes place. So, uh, looking at the the iron absorption cycle, um, the heme iron um, is absorbed through the GI tract. On the top part of the uh, slide, it shows the small intestinal lumen, so that's on our GI side. As it's absorbed, the heme uh, is broken down. 
and it, it changes. It, it's in a, a Fe2 state, so there's two cations uh, that are, that are present, and um, this gets converted uh, and attached to ferritin, uh, but, and it, it's in a Fe3 state. And this is where one of the coenzymes, the copper, is needed to be allow it uh, to allow it for that ferritin iron molecule within the cell to get transported into the circulation. And as the previous slide shows, then now the transferrin binds it into an Fe3 state, and um, that sort of carrier molecule. And this is where that 30% number came from. It takes it to the end organ where it needs to be processed, whether it's in the bone marrow, it's in the red cells in the form of a muscle, uh, or muscle cells in the form of a myoglobin, or it takes into the liver. The non-heme sources of our iron are directly absorbed in the form of an Fe2, and then they follow essentially the same pathway because once they're absorbed into the GI uh, uh, luminal sides of the cell, the pathway from there is all uh, the same. Uh, looking at the iron uh, components in different parts of that pathway that we talked about, total iron binding capacity uh, approximates the measure of the transferrin, and that's sort of on the laboratory studies that we look at, we'll, we've all noticed in our CBC component or iron studies, some places we'll have, uh, you know, iron level ferritin and a measure called TIBC, and that's the total iron binding capacity. Uh, serum iron is a measure of the iron bound to the transferrin. Um, and uh, about 30% of that is what uh, what is met, you know, 30% is normally what's bound to it. So if you want to really know the total amount of it, you can take the transferring percent and add 60% to it. That, that gives you a total uh, amount of iron that's serum iron that's present because the transferring only measures about 30% of it uh, per se. The efficiency detected, and I've got two slides on this. I, you know, I think one of them makes a little more sense than the other one visually for me, at least. So, but um, the the efficiency of the iron can be detected in different phases. Um, uh, one of the simplest thing that we're looking at the CBC would be to look at a hemoglobin hematocrit. But as I said a little earlier, that's sort of one of the the, the things that probably comes up at a later. Uh, measure of index because it did, all of the storage mechanisms have been depleted. So iron deficiency is by far the best screen way to measure uh, for deficiency, not necessarily hemoglobin hematocrit, unless a patient is known to have no, no iron deficiency per se. A serum ferritin of less than 30 milligram per liter uh, in, in a female or less than 10 per man is, is sort of considered to be iron deficiency. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant, as we talked about on the previous slide. Uh, things like inflammatory reaction, cancer, liver disease can falsely elevate uh, ferritin. And we sort of, in some cancer patients, we follow the ferritin as a uh, broad, inaccurate way of looking at any recurrences or anything like that. Um, looking at, again at the iron uh, absorption and this. Uh, so Show any better or no? Not really. This book. Maybe I need vitamin D. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was just going to suggest maybe we should have everyone bring their iPads. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, iron absorption, so on the intestinal side, so this goes from left to right. Again, the heme iron or the non-heme iron is absorbed into the cell. They're converted within the enterocyte. Enterocyte means the absorptive cells that are lining our entire uh, the GI tract. And in this case, we're talking specifically about the duodenum where the absorption takes place. The iron is absorbed and converted in the Fe3 state, and there is an equilibrium that continuously goes on between Fe2 and Fe3. It's sort of converted from one to the other. Uh, this is all converted to Fe2, uh, uh, and it's absorbed through the ferritin, uh, uh, ferroprotein uh, uh, receptors, and taken uh, on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see where it requires the ceridoplastin, which is the enzyme that's needed when it, the copper is involved. 
or this conversion and carrier and eventually is taken back by the transferrin the transferrin molecule which is a which is a transporting truck of the iron and it takes to the end organ and those that, that can be delivered, the spleen, bone marrow, muscle mass, uh, the, the muscle for myoglobin, and so forth. So um, the, there's, uh, depending on which part of the pathway we're looking at, there are different indexes that we can look at and identify uh, a, a laboratory evidence of iron deficiency. You can look at the transferrin level and how much of it is saturated. You can actually look at the actual iron level uh, in the bloodstream again whether this is, uh, uh, you know, what the level of this is, and then end stage where you can look at the red cell, for example. The point being is that though, as we go further away, the indication are less and less accurate, and there's a latency by which time when it develops, it may be already too late, uh, for example. Iron absorption in the duodenum. Um, I want to talk about this a little because uh, th there's some implications of patient, and we'll talk about it here, taking, uh, you know, antacids forever and ever. So gastric acid is produced by the stomach, and it lowers the pH in the proximal duodenum. Uh, this is why patients with gastric bypass operation have a high incidence of developing uh, marginal ulcer, because the stomach, even though a very small part of it is connected to the small bowel, it's, uh, the, the acid part, the acid producing part of the stomach dumps acid into the small bowel, and there is no neutralization, whereas in the duodenal switch or in the normal anatomy, as the acidic content of the stomach are dumped into the duodenum, there is a, a, a bicarbonate addition to the pancreatic ducts where it sort of neutralizes the acid. But the point in this case is that as it lower pH um, content of the stomach are added into the duodenum, that creates a favorable environment for iron uh, Fe2 absorption. Um, and uh, uh, ascorbate and citric acid increase uh, intake by acting as a weak chelators that sort of helps the, uh, to uh, solubilize the iron itself uh, and make it more absorbable in the duodenum. Iron is rarely transferred from uh, acrobat and citrate into the mucosal lining of the cell. The uh, citrate also makes uh, the environment a little more acidic, which is in addition to the acidity of the stomach secretion, makes it more favorable, favorable to get absorbed. So um, another slide again showing sort of the same thing as to you have the uh, scorbic acid on the GI tract, the duodenal end of side of it, which makes the absorption of the dietary iron to be better transferred all the way into the uh, uh, blood uh, circulation side of it. What's important for us to appreciate is that though, what also happens in the stomach that has to do with iron absorption is the B12 uh, absorption. So uh, being uh, a vitamin that we always uh, talk about, the B12 deficiency in the food uh, and or gastrectomy, uh, such as the duodenal switch or the gastric by, you know, gastric bypass, and it came up uh, even though it's not removed, it's excluded, or with a sleeve gastrectomy where it's removed, and or atrophic gastritis. This is where the lining of the stomach becomes atrophic because of disuse or uh, aging process. All of those things can reduce a uh, relationship between the intrinsic factor and the B12 that's supposed to take place. And if those reactions don't take place, then you do have actually malabsorption and you have macrocytic anemia due to failure of the maturation of the red cells. So going back to one of the very earlier slides that I said is that when we're talking about iron deficiency, we, can't ju we, ha we cannot just focus on whether I'm taking the iron or not. We have to take whether we're taking all of the components that we need to make a red cells and whether those processes are taking place in the proper, proper places or not and if there are any other deficiencies that may be causing this. Deficiency detection, the definitive test for an iron deficiency anemia is sort of a, a Persian uh, blue staining of the blood smear. So this is when they draw the blood, the pathologist sort of puts it in under a slide and looks at it after staining it. The, the top image demonstrates an absence of the iron, that sort of blue dust, the, the blue color content uh, in the macrophages compared to the upper and the below uh, and the uh, image below, uh, lower, where the normal bone marrow stain with Persian blue demonstrates granular source of the iron in the macrophages. So you don't see those blue uh, iron deposits that are within the macrophages on the top one. That's an iron deficiency slide. 
iron deficiency anemia uh, develops gradually um, and this is why patients that show present with iron deficiency anemia need, need to be very patient because iron deficiency will not develop overnight unless it's a surgical bleed and it's certainly not going to uh, get resolved overnight. Storage iron in the bone marrow is the first to become uh, depleted and this is way before even the hemoglobin and hematocrit would start moving. Serum ferritin level decreases and while the hemoglobin hematocrit and MCV remain normal, which is all in late phase, in, in time, serum iron decreases and iron binding capacity increases. I'm going to say this one more time. The serum iron will go down where iron binding capacity will go up. So um, that's sort of one of the uh, you know, mid time frame things that we see when we look at an iron study and we see the TIBC is elevated. Again, TIBC stands for total, total iron binding capacity. That's an indication that all of those uh, uh, transferrin are trying to uh, to to uh, soak up all of the iron are working extra hard and because there is a disproportionate lower iron to higher TIBC there's more of it being absorbed and there, the protein is fighting harder to capture them also that number goes up so TIBC which is elevated is a sign of iron deficiency anemia um, and uh, later synthesis of the hemoglobin and hematocrit, hemoglobin becomes, uh, uh, hemoglobin is a cell, hematocrit is a, is a calculated measure. Hemoglobin uh, is impaired and that lack of iron uh, is only then recognizable in sort of a later end of the, uh, later and uh, later, later stages of our, uh, uh, of the uh, anemia, iron deficiency anemia. So uh, this is one of the slides that sort of makes uh, much more sense visually to me. And as we go from left to right, you can see on the top graph different phases. And uh, on the bottom, it sort of shows the measures that start uh, going down. So um, we can see that in a normal range on the very first column, these are the indexes that you see in a patient that has uh, sort of the normal indexes, normal iron level. And it's really not till, you know, if we go to the um, hemoglobin, it's not really till you ha already have developed sort of a late iron deficiency where the hemoglobin starts dropping. So that's sort of about the last three columns. So the earlier things that show themselves are iron saturation, the serum ferritin level, which want to make, you know, keep them at 30, 40 or higher level. And in some patients, we'll see them hovering around, you know, 10, 9, 11, 12 or so with a normal hemoglobin hematocrit, which puts them somewhere in this range where they've already had the iron deficiency going on. And with any continuous blood loss and or iron loss, and this doesn't have to be any blood loss per se, you know, that about 90 plus percent of the iron in our bodies are circulated. Some of it is lost to tissues and GI tract and so forth. So over time, there will be need to repl replenishment. So if a patient walks around with a hemoglobin 12 and 13 with low iron level, they're bound over the next few months, few years to develop iron deficiency anemia because technically, even though they're not anemic, they're iron deficient, as the slide shows. The treatment should be first and foremost treat, treating the underlying cause. So if there is any blood loss that needs to be corrected, and we see this in our female patient population that are having uh, more frequent heavier menstrual losses and as it needs to be corrected, um, I'll, I'll use this opportunity to make an editorial note that I think uh, patients that are having a problem with that should really consider and avoid getting depot shot or norplant, which are hormonally uh, manipulating menstrual cycle, and they've been known to cause uh, weight gain. Uh, that's sort of a weight loss surgical perspective, why I think we should avoid those. Um, uh, close monitoring of the iron ferritin and transferrin level. And as far as correcting the underlying causes, we should not only focus on the iron, but we should also focus on uh, protein as well as uh, other, uh, you know, micro, macro and micromolecules such as copper and so forth um, to make sure that all of the building blocks are available to be able to allow us for uh, iron absorption to take place. The treatment for orally is, uh, and I'm sure this is probably going to, uh, incite a lot of uh, emails, texts, and calls. Uh, this is not supposed to be all inclusive or, and all applicable to everyone. But oral administration of ferrous fumarate and sulfate is a therapy that still is recommended. 
the starting dose is about 325 milligram, and you can increase it to about 900 milligram, usually to, uh, for two or three months. Uh, the complications include uh, nausea, abdominal cramp, constipation, and diarrhea. And there are patients that have some, and the, some patients have one extreme or the other one. One of the problem with iron uh, oral supplementation, and we'll talk about the heme iron that sort of reduces some of the side effect, is a compliance issue that patients tend to, they, they, they develop one or two of these side effects. They have a hard time coping with it long term, so the compliance goes down with it. Um, which, uh, given uh, the nature of um, uh, the chronic nature of iron deficiency, gives us the luxury of being able to say, well, um, if I can find, for example, that taking a certain amount of iron day, every day makes me constipated, but if I go down to three times a week that I'm managing my GI tracts are manageable and I'm sort of maintaining my iron level is what we should consider doing. So it gives the patient a little leeway to, to play with this in order to maximize the nutrition need for iron absorption and minimize the GI uh, side effects. So, as I said, heme iron is uh, also being now recommended uh, as a better option for GI. Iron medication should be stored away from children uh, because of, uh, you know, put significant potential toxicity in, in children if taken large doses uh, uh, without supervision. Um, take the iron on an empty stomach if possible with a little orange juice and the orange juice, as we talked about, to sort of acidify. And taking irons with antacid makes no sense. And we're going to talk about that in a sec, um, uh, a little more detail, I think. Treatment of uh, iron, if oral does not work, uh, should be considered as iron um, in a form of uh, iron sucrose infusion. And this can be done on a sporadic basis once a patient is on a chronic um, maintenance uh, schedule. We do have a number of patients over the years, and now we're going into about, I don't know, 16 years post-op. Uh, a few patients that are requiring regular iron infusion. And um, I think we need to appreciate that iron deficiency in some subset of patient population who are having weight loss surgery and a subset of those patients who've had dual switch operation will be one of those nutritional prices that we have to pay. And um, it, it, I think every patient needs to appreciate that the alternative would be not to have lost the weight and have to go in for treatment for diabetes and sleep apnea and so forth. I think, you know, going in for once or twice a, a year for a few days to get iron infusion may be a reasonable price uh, to correct some nutritional deficiency that's very specific to the condition that we're dealing with. Uh, it is critical to also appreciate that iron deficiency anemia take uh, to develop over time, and it will take as long, if not longer, to correct the deficiency. Um, let's talk about the long-term effect of the proton pump inhibitors, which is what we see every so often. Um, the so-called purple pill that's advertised on TV, it's been shown over and over again, and this was sort of a, and I don't think you folks can see this, but it's down there. There's a reference for a relatively new published study that talked about the long-term effect of the PPIs, hyperchlorohydria, thrombocytopenia, so uh, um, low acid, low chloride, uh, low platelet count, iron deficiency, low vitamin D, rhabdomyolysis. This is when the muscle fibers start breaking down and uh, acute interstitial nephritis. They can be toxic to the kidneys. The proton pump inhibitors were never designed to be long-term uh, medications. They were designed to be temporary and it's sort of taken a hold that we've accepted the, the proton pump inhibitors to be a long-term treatment. From the perspective of our discussion, the importance of this is that if we're developing significantly neutralized acidic environment in our stomach, we're eff uh, effectively uh, disrupting the chemical uh, environment that's needed to allow for iron absorption. So, the less acidic there is, as you saw on the slides earlier, the less chance of the iron being absorbed. Uh, and so we may be taking a lot of the iron, we're chasing with some, you know, <coughs> protonics or Pepsi, and we're not able to absorb that, uh, the iron. So in summary of the laboratory finding iron deficiency anemia, the, uh, decreased hemoglobin and hematocrit is one of the, uh, the, the latest uh, findings that we see, maybe one of the more common numbers that we encounter first because we're not looking at the iron uh, deficiency all the time. Um, 
I'll also sort of look at, uh, you know, use this opportunity to make a sort of a non-clinical issue um, where we uh, are being told by a lot of, uh, by, by a number of our patients who get into a, a billing issue with the insurances and or labs that we send the iron studies, even though our iron uh, orders do indicate that the patient is, uh, is ha has had a malabsorptive procedure, so there's a malabsorption code, an iron uh, deficiency code. For most of the payers, they consider iron studies to be only if there's other clinical diagnosis indicated. So this is something that we all need to be prepared to file a little. That's why probably, uh, you know, uh, primary cares knowing that rightfully so, they will not order an iron deficiency anemia until there is a reason which is manifested by low hemoglobin hematocrit, which as I said a little earlier, it's already one of the later reasons. Hypochromic microcytic uh, red blood cells on a prefer smear, and this is sort of the pale small red cells on the slide that the pathologist can make. Decreased serum iron and uh, increased TIBC is one of the first things that uh, sort of uh, shows when you do the iron study. And um, uh, last but not least, and probably left for a, a hematologist, oncologist to do as a last resort if the picture is not clear, would be to do a bone marrow biopsy and to look at the iron stores and decrease serum ferritin. So um, these are sort of uh, the order with which most clinicians will see iron deficiency anemia, but it's not in the order that at the cellular level in our body, the deficiency develops. Uh, and I think that's it. Uh, thank you. Okay. Can I impose on one of you gentlemen to turn on the light? Because I think my integrate my um ooh, all right. Huh? <clears throat> yes, it is. So how do I turn this off? And how do I do this? And what do I do now? Eighty per eighty million, doesn't it? This is to Um, should we be supplementing with copper? Um, of the many, many years that we've been checking copper, I think I've only seen maybe a handful of patients that have actually had um, laboratory finding of copper deficiency. Um, so I guess if a patient is taking iron supplements and there's all the other causes have been identified not to, uh, and then we can't explain why the patient is having iron deficiency, I would, yes, recommend to consider having uh, some copper supplement to push that up. But as I said, I've never, I've very rarely seen patient with clinical, with laboratory copper deficiency. We see more often uh, deficiencies of zinc, or zinc present, but not the copper. As you as a mobile, that's why I can't. Right. 
Julie says we cannot hear. Can you folks hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so now I understand what you're saying. Uh, the, the the question about uh, conversion from one to the other. So um, you do. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I have to check on this. I'm not sure if the uh, if you can just sort of assume that 65 milligram of element of iron from one form is equal to the elemental form of the other one. Even though uh, you know on on the box it may sound elemental. So there there is. This may be the preparation and, uh, and that when it comes to uh, supplements like this, I think um, the best way to start would be to maximize the dose with keeping an eye on the GI, uh, GI and the side effects of it. Now, we talked about that you know, in the iron, theoretically, there's much less GI disturbances, so you can push that up. But uh, I would basically get on a certain amount of dose uh, you know, so if 325 milligram two or three times a day has 65 milligram of elemental iron, you want to take that maybe twice a day and be on it for a time frame, uh, a month or two, make sure there's no absor there, there's no blood losses and everything else, your protein level and copper and all that stuff is in normal range. Check, check the numbers, check the follow-up laboratory studies, and if they're okay, then you have a baseline as to how much improvement you've had. If, if there's any GI disturbances, you can back or increase the dose based on that. And I think, uh, you know, even if we're not talking about iron, if we're just talking about regular iron, when I recommend patients iron to take, I'll say start with the basic dose of one or two tablets a day and let your GI dictate how much you can and cannot uh, tolerate. And because that does become um, a, a limiting factor when we're talking about iron supplements. Right, it's at 325 right now. Um, so copper deficiency, as I said, will I've, I've seen in rare occasions that it develops. We see copper deficiency, some, uh, some rare autoimmune diseases too, and it's relatively easy to supplement in oral form, and I don't even know what the dose is, and in, in a few patients uh, for other than iron deficiency in things like uh, delayed wound healing, uh, patients uh, that have, uh, you know, uh, uh, very broad-based wound infections, uh, you know, burn injuries and things like that do develop from copper because it's needed for healthy cellular growth and so forth. And those patients would sort of uh, resort to uh, iron, uh, you know, copper injection uh, uh, supplementation. Um, going back to uh, issue of iron deficiency and menopause and, and, uh, and the weight loss surgery, um, it is important to appreciate that any blood loss, whether it be result of uh, menstrual losses, GI losses, we're not only losing the iron, we're also losing all of the electrolytes, all of the proteins, and all of the cells and macro and micro molecules that are available in the red cells. So we need to account for the protein losses, the iron losses, copper and zinc, and so forth. So uh, the treatment, in my opinion, should be least invasive, minimally invasive, that uh, has the, less, the least amount of effect hormonally, because from weight loss per perspective, we always have to worry about the long-term effect of hormonal manipulation such as depot shot and norplans and things like that that can cause weight gain. So I'll have, I'll recommend that every female patient have a very candid and detailed discussion about this. And I know 
from what I see, and I realize that patients that come to our office are only those who've gained weight, but the significance of the weight gain is, in my opinion, overly uh, underrepresented when it comes to this. Um, when it comes to, uh, you know, Norplants and depot shots for uh, pregnant, uh, for um, birth control. So, um, <clears throat> so the the issue when it comes to um, you know the long term issue. Um, it, it, this is a long-term issue, and um, uh, I, I I know that Venifer is expensive. That's why some places aren't using it. But um, if a patient has enough reserve, then now would be the time to think about starting on iron dosing. Um, not now, because if a patient is so close post-op, then iron is going to cause havoc on the GI tract. So I'll probably stay low for about one or two or three months, and then at that point start slowly adding a little iron uh, orally, uh, and then um, get the blood work done with the expectation that oral iron is not going to have as much of a quick bang um, on the measurable indexes uh, on the blood, but at least we're not falling behind long term and we're just maintaining it. So. Right, and that the, the point is also is when patients are, um, uh, you know, a patient that's a revision patient or it's a gastric bypass patient, there's a number of reasons why the iron deficiency will be much more dramatic and uh, unresponsive to standard treatment before the revisions than after the revision. Uh, you know, we outlined as to how gastric bypass on a couple of places has significant implication on iron deficiency, and if a patient has been uh, revised to the duodenal sewage operation. Some of the iron deficiency may be residual effect of the gastric bypass. We just need to give time for our GI tract to get reclimated and then absorption take place and it'll, it'll, it'll eventually uh, get back to uh, a better place than it was previously with the caveat being that as uh, you know is, is brought up this is not this is a chronic problem and it's going to require long term for it to be corrected. Um, uh, Venifer is one of those supplements that can be given relatively quickly, short period of time, and the reason why we use Venifer, and it is correct, the observation someone made is very expensive, is because it has, because of its chemical formulation, it's, uh, you can give it over a short period of time, much faster, much, much less chance of allergic and or cardiotoxic uh, reaction. Right, I would say the key would be to, for, for all of us as patients, realize and understand what we have and try to educate our physicians the best we can. Uh, um, right, I think as far as insurance is concerned, um, I think there are other formularies of iron available that may be much more cost effective. So, yeah. Right. The coding has to be correct too, I think. Uh, uh, maybe malabsorption needs to be emphasized and so forth. Uh, to make sure that this is not just for or, or iron deficiency, blood losses, and so forth. 
Any other questions? You guys have any questions? We're working? I guess we'll know. I guess we'll find out. You guys can turn back so you don't do the back spasm if you want. I just. She had done. That come up. She had me so and I take this up. It continued taking. Okay. Any GI issues? <laughs> so you know, th this is what I was saying. So you know, if you have taken the Profarin ES, and now, you know, we'll check the lab book next, and it shows that it's worked. Then now you have the option of saying, so I've taken this, and it's worked. But if I back three days out of the week, instead of taking two doses, I go one dose back, and now that'll eliminate the need for it to be on Miralax, then I think that's what you should do. I think iron is one of those things that it has such a low absorptive uh, coefficient. I think it's like 20% of what we take gets absorbed. You can play with it. You know, taking one extra here and there is not going to make a big changes in the scheme, but it's going to reduce your your side effect right. issues that you have with it. It's not even too balanced. It can be a big issue in my whole life. I mean, I mean, you know what I mean? Like, trying to find out where where's that magic solution of supplementing something that I'm staying healthy and at the same time stable. And that's so individualize what works right. for you and what works for the person. Yeah, and, and I seem to have gone from hemorrhoids to the absence of Which is why, you know, I would just, you know, on the air in front of a dozen people, I'll make the following. Yeah, God and everybody, I'll make it. Well, <laughs> at least, you, you know, they didn't see your face. I would make the following recommendation. Now would be the time to start backing up one day at a time. And figure out for yourself, okay, no, at seven days twice a day, I'm down to four days twice a day and three days once a day, and this does the trick. Let's stay there for a few months and recheck, see where it is. The tricky part is knowing what your iron is. Yeah. Right. You know what your bowel is going to the iron level. Right. And the problem with it is that, though, is you know, what the iron does today is not going to be reflected for three months. So now that you've already you know, your blood is going to be drawn soon. Mm -hmm. So what do you do next week or so is going to have an impact on that? Right. So start your experiment today. Okay. Your blood will be drawn next few days and start backing off in a month or two, recheck those indexes and we'll know, okay, for on a month or for two months, we've been on this regimen. I know what my GI is doing and this is what the end result of the lab was. That's where it is or no, I need to up it down, up it up the dose or no, I have more room to go back down on it. And as far out as you are about four years in, Five years. Five years. Wow. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Are you sure? Wow. Wow. Anyway, so you're five years out. Um, you know, in the scheme of things, these are small things that needs to be addressed. You know. If, um, so let's do this. That's where we're going. So, yeah. Uh, So we're going to start the lecture again. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, so this is the, um, I guess there's a question as to um, how come did the ferritin go from 51 
to 8 and the hemoglobin stayed around 12.5. This slide shows is as to how, oh. All right. So, um, uh, so if you look at the um, the the the, the ferritin uh, or the hemoglobin, your hemoglobin on the third uh, third row from the bottom can sort of stay the same for a relatively long period of time, and it really takes a lot of iron deficiency. Um, that's because the the uh, iron stores in your body, think of it as a sponge. You, you know, you, you have a sponge and you, 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 have, you sort of drip water on it and that, uh, that the water dripping on the sponge represents the iron that you're being absorbed, you're absorbing. You know, you're gonna have to drip a lot of water on that sponge before it starts leaking from the other side. And then when that whole sponge is saturated, even if you stop adding water to it, you can still squeeze the sponge and it'll still drip the iron, the iron on the bottom. So this iron on the bottom represents your hemoglobin. The iron, the water on the top of the sponge represents the your iron that's coming in, the sort of ferritin. The, the, so the 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 mechanism, the protein that carries the iron will stay saturated by squeezing its volume down to maintain your hemoglobin. Which is why on the slide I said is if you only base the level of your hemoglobin as a measure of your iron deficiency, you will only catch that story at a very late part of it. And so we need to pay attention to iron studies, to TIBC, the ferritin level, which are relatively earlier indexes. So ferritin level will drop first, then the transferrin will start slowly dropping later, and then hemoglobin will be last, or not last, but hemoglobin will be one of the other things that will stop, start dropping. So the hemoglobin will drop, and that means you're way behind on your iron. Yes. Right. And actually, in a, in a case of a big blood loss, immediately after surgery, if you have a big blood loss, you'll have no drop in hemoglobin. Your hematica will stay the same, but the next blood four hours later will be massively dropped down. Now, as you said, but you're correct. You know, the, the it's a late index for um, for evaluation for iron deficiency. But we talked about this too, and as she was talking about, you know, the insurance issue. That's a problem. The cost of doing iron study for health insurance is much more expensive than doing a typical hemoglobin hematocrit. So the knee-jerk reflex is that though, we'll check your hemoglobin hem hematocrit if it's normal then you don't have to worry about it. The problem is that there is no one putting the bits and pieces of this puzzle together. The idea is as a weight loss patient, if I do not have an, an obvious ongoing losses, I may still not be absorbing enough, which means that my iron deficiency is gonna fall off way for a long period of time before my hemoglobin matter could show. So this is a show though, now, now you're way behind your iron, it's been a long time you've been Absolutely, which is why we talked about is right. by the time this you you're, you're catching that with low hemoglobin hematocrit, this story has been going on for a year or two. It's going to take you a few months to bring that up somehow. They don't think about it. No. Um, one of the things I uh, I I meant to put it in a slide, but I didn't. I guess I'm just thinking about it. Is um, the the issue of transfusion? Um, Transfusing blood is very quick and relatively safe. Actually, it's a lot safer now than a lot of other stuff that we do, such as driving on an interstate in California. Um, it's a very safe and quick way to increase your hemoglobin and only indirectly helps with your iron. The longevity of transfused iron in our blood system is a week or two, for example, the, even though it's type and cross and it's supposed to be the same type of blood, there's always some antibody that our body says, yeah, this is not a perfect match, so I'm gonna eat it, actually. Essentially, macrophages, the sort of the, the garbage disposer of our body starts eating all of those red cells, and then they break that down into the byproducts, one of which is iron. So you will get a delayed iron infusion but you just had to have the blood transfusion to get a secondary iron infusion long term. So that's not really a good way to do it, but you can sort of essentially get that done too.
one of the potential cause, uh, not that I know of in an oral dose, you mean, you, you know, uh, you, you can't really uh, absorb enough iron to cause iron, uh, iron, to cause kidney disease. In fact, actually, kidney disease can cause iron deficiency anemia. The way that works is that though is there are pressure sensors in the within the structure of the kidney that sense there are pre pressure transducers if you would and if the pressure transducers are low they perceive the body's circulating volume to be low it's like a sensor that senses the hydraulic pressure of a pump and it says if this pressure isn't high enough i don't have enough fuel so add fuel in our body's fuel is the blood so if the pressure sensors in within the kidney go down then there's a chemical called erythropoietin that's secreted erythropoietin goes to the bone marrow and tells to start be building more red cells which is why when we give patients iron infusion every so often we will give them a uh, we'll give them a shot of erythropoietin and if you thought venifer is expensive erythropoietin is about three times more expensive than the venifer so uh, in fact, uh, patients that have chronic renal failure and are dialysis have to continuously, on a regular basis, once a month, get a shot of erythropoietin during their dialysis to have that external stimulation to the bone marrow to keep building the red cells. Otherwise, your body just ends up destroying the red cells and nothing builds, builds that back up. Iron toxicity, like, it does not your kidney that's through just gi and yeah if i remember correctly you can cause things like seizure and things like that but not okay yeah. um, any patient who is on protonics long term is at risk of developing all of the um, issues that we talked about with um uh, PPIs, low platelet count, uh, you know, uh, iron deficiency, uh, rhabdomyolysis, and so forth and so on. Uh, but antacids, oh. they're all that family of the, the you know, the, um, the specifically the PPIs have a much more broader spectrum of potential complications. Now, the next thing is in Right, Nexium, protonics, omeprazole, right. and things like that, and you know, but but, but, but you know, protonics and you know, you're you're talking about the, the Prevacid, Pepsid, protonics, you know, Zantac, and all that. These are different categories of classes of anti, you know, uh, medications for reflux and all that. And PPIs tend to have the most broadest. They're very effective, but they're also the broadest. Uh, complication spectrum of things that happen. One of the things that I've, I've heard some gastroenterologists recommend, and I guess sort of makes sense, I've never seen any study on that, is to f have patients go from a class to a class over a rotational period of time. Now, this doesn't address sort of one or two of the fundamental problems that by reducing the acidic environment of your GI tract, you're reducing your iron absorption, which is the topic today. So whether you reduce that by uh, taking a bottle of Maalox or Mylanta or having two PPIs every day, the end result is the same. You're, you're, you reduce the acidity of your stomach, and that's, um, that results in low iron absorption. Another aspect of this would be that one can say by having had the vertical sieve gastrectomy or the duodenal switch, by having removed majority of the stomach, you've already physically reduced majority of the volume where this acid produces anyway, which may be one of the variables why we see a little more uh, iron deficiency. Um, only yeah. we, we men complain more but bleed less. So I guess that would be the only difference between men and women. <laughs> so I, I'm not aware of any um, uh, differences with regards to the anemia, other than you know, uh, you know, menstrual losses with the uh, with the blood loss in females. Uh, we'll talk about it maybe another three months post op.
Um, there's a there is an issue with B6 and vitamin A level not being paid. Yes, we've seen that, and that goes along with the fact that again, those, those you know vitamin A specifically is one of those lab draws that very few places do it. And other than um, weight loss surgical environment, and other than some very very unique um, malabsorptive conditions that have nothing to do with weight loss, no one really knows of vitamin A deficiency. So all of the health plans, actually even you know today's physicians are being trained here. I mean, the, the textbooks still say vitamin A deficiency is what you see in South Sub-Saharan Africa. You'll never see one in the U.S. And you know, you know, and and that, that it is what it is. So and you know, I think we need to you know maybe we need a little updating as to how things are changing. But so when it comes to third-party payers, their policy still assumes that it's a condition that's very rarely seen, and unless there is a a patient that goes to an ophthalmologist and says, I can't see, and they just happen to suspect, which hasn't happened here, we've seen that, no one has that index of suspicion to look at it, they think about vitamin A deficiency, we don't see um, that being uh, picked up. The problem is that, though, is if you let a patient develop vitamin A deficiency on clinical basis, you're running the risk of having permanent eye injury, retinal detachment, and or loss of visual acuity that may or may not be corrected with vitamin A. So um, uh, on this question that's posted here, uh, you know, we have seen some patients have problem and just take some call on the patients and letters back and forth to get it all squared away. We have we, we had a patient here some time ago that presented and uh, had been from urologist to ophthalmologist to primary care, and the best advice was that go get a seeing dog. Honestly, was or, told. Or get a vitamin A shot. Go get a seeing dog. Don't worry about it. This is it's you know you're you're going blind for an unknown reason, and um, I think her you know this is a, it was a, you know the vitamin A level was like two or three. And gave her a shot, came back a month later, and completely seeing she should see better that night, and she's back to it. But again, this is sort of one of those things that um, if 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 we don't think about it, we will never see it, and we'll never look for it. Okay, two weeks is not long term. We're talking about patients that take the PPI for three to six months. We do realize that in a subset of patients that are on PPIs, uh, because of hiatal hernia, because of their sleep, because of their revisions, uh, in our practice we see patients that have had the lap band, and because of the significant stricture and tightening of the lap band, they have developed. Um, esophageal dysmotility, esophagus isn't moving, they're pushing the food down, and they've developed this chronic reflux. They have to be on some sort of an antacid, one of them may be PPI class of medications. I think the, the purpose of this was not to sort of alarm anyone, but just to educate all of us that PPIs are not as benign as they are led to believe at 8 o'clock on TV between, you know, uh, sitcoms where we just see take the purple pill and everything would be fine. It's really not that easy. It may not be fine. Point being made is that we need to be uh, acutely aware of ups and downs that can happen with the PPIs. And in the context of our discussion today, is that re any medication that reduces the acid acidic environment of the stomach is bound to reduce the iron absorption, and it can lead to iron deficiency. Um, the size of the size of the hernia is um, in the is it's irrelevant to whether a patient takes protonics or not. Protonics should be only taken for the symptoms, not the size of the hernia. So if a patient has no symptoms, then I don't think you should be taking any protonics. And um, 
ideally you can see if you can find other medications other than a PPI or protonics so, you know the, the, the simpler the medication the better it is or, or alternate them as some gastroenterologists have recommended So no, if right, yeah, you you can fluctuate the ferritin relatively quickly. You can give a patient two doses of venifer tonight, and the ferritin may be a little higher tomorrow. But hemoglobin hematica will take a little while to ramp up. It, it takes a few days for the red cells to be made, and the long lifespan of a red cell is 210, you know. Uh, so th there is a latency between the iron going up and the hemoglobin hematocrit reflective of that. That time frame is much shorter than the latency on the other end where the ferritin will go down before the hemoglobin hematocrit come back. So I would venture to guess that unless there is a lab error, what you're describing is the time frame between which the iron was supplemented and had recovered, but that not had been enough time for the hemoglobin hematocrit to catch up with the improvement in the ferritin level. Um, usually on uh, primary duodenal switches, I have the patients on medications for about a month, and then I have them wean it off. For revisions, I usually keep them on about two or three months till they're able to demonstrate that the food is going down relatively easily and there's no suspected stricture ulcer and then you can still, you know, wean it off. And I'm not sure if there's any weaning off. It's sort of get up on Monday morning and I'm done with taking the PPI and let's see what happens. Well, you had silent GERD because you were on PPIs. So, um, uh, Uh, PPI. So the PPI, um, I, I think, Stacey, we and I need to talk about this a little detail. I mean, I don't want to go to your medical history uh, here, but there's there's more to this than just being described. So um, a patient that is having silent GERD should not be treated with PPI. That makes no sense because the PPIs are only masking the symptom of the acidity. They're not correcting the underlying reflux. So that by itself is not an indication for being PPI. That is the cause of the PPI. You're having, you know, patients having silent reflux because they're on PPI. So one has to look at anatomically um, whether there, are the, if there's a hiatal hernia repair that has slipped, and we know that hiatal hernia slips, they can be repaired. Some patients have to go back and then have, uh, as a secondary procedure, have a mesh placed. Sometimes even the mesh repair, those things fail. Those are things that can be done, but they need to be studied. So, um, uh, I, I, uh, so just one more time, silent reflux is actually the end result of a patient that's having reflux because of hiatal hernia, but it's been masked because of the PPIs. Um, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, what do you do if you have a breakthrough uh, acid with while you're on protonics twice a day? I think it's important to look at this in the context of whether the patient is a primary patient or a, or a revision. Uh, primary patients, it's one thing I would say, you know, we sort of have to look at it and maybe take some, you know, other medication, you know, Pepsi, Prevacid, or sort of what you're eating in a revision patient, um, uh, and revisions, whether it's from a bypass to the duodenal switch or whether it's from the band to the duodenal switch, because of the stricture, because of the anatomical variation, because of the dilation of the esophagus, because of the presence of a hiatal hernia, all of which or some of which may be present, the anatomy plays a significant role into as to whether that reflux is actually acid reflux or whether it's swelling in the middle or, or part of the anastomosis that needs time to get better. So in the short term, immediately post-op, my recommendation would be to 
take uh, other over-the-counter antacids, uh, knowing, uh, you know, things like Melox, Mylanta, uh, some like that will help. Topical, Pepto-Bismol, for example, will help. And um, keeping an eye on that, that this needs to be sort of a short-term temporary measure, assuming that uh, part of this is related to the swelling of extensive surgery that's done very high on the stomach. And as the swelling and the scar down settles down, that reflux is going to get better. Yes, you can call me another time. Call the office and the girl will set something up. Any other questions? Very good. Thank you very much, everyone. Huh? <laughs> All, down an hour by <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Huh? Thank you.